Today I am so excited to be building perhaps the first ever completely new Commodore 64 made of 100% new parts. They're all sitting comfortably here on the desk as you can see. We'll be taking a look at their specs. <clears throat> I suggest you get comfortable too. Welcome to Retro Recipes. Welcome. Okay, well here we are. Let's just cut straight to the action because, I, as I said, I am really excited to get going here. All this is possible thanks to these. These have just arrived literally yesterday. They are the brand new keycaps that have been created through an Indiegogo campaign that I supported. Uh, and he has done a really good job from what I can see. I haven't opened them yet, but all the bits are here. Now, quick disclaimer on that note. I did do a video a couple of years ago where I created what I called an all new Commodore 64. As you may know, the one thing really stopping us making the completely new C64 is the lack of keycaps. For that video, I created my own Lego keycaps because as we discovered through a magical coincidence, these little crosshead shaped things in the bottom of the Commodore keys are the exact same as in Lego bricks. Here is that exact keyboard. And as you can see, it's fully functional, but the actual keys are indeed Lego. And in that old video, I said this, now I have no doubt that better options will come along in a year or four, but for now, I hope this ah, Damn it, I was out by two months. <laughs> now you can still order that keycap set on my website, but as a few commenters pointed out, we can't guarantee that it's 100% new because the place those bricks are sourced is Bricklink. Some of the sellers do piece out brand new uh, Lego kits to get those bricks, but some of them are nearly new <laughs> in good condition, but not brand new. And I wanted to do this really properly. And now, thanks to these, we can actually do that. To start with, I'm going to take you through everything that's on the desk here, one piece at a time. Then we're going to build it, test it, and celebrate. <laughs> so this, first of all, is the MechBoard 64. This was created by Lau Bricks, and he made the project open source. So I was able to buy this ready manufactured one from a seller on eBay. It's got a shift lock circuit. You can apply a locking switch there or a momentary switch, which will toggle between shift lock on and off. And it's as simple as that. This should be a straight replacement. Now they do also give you these, but we'll come to that. This is a brand new case from icomp.de. And uh, I've chosen transparent because I wanted to be able to see our new motherboard that we're putting in there. And if you didn't know the story, Someone actually found the original Commodore 64C molds. I think they were in Germany and purchased them and is now creating these. So these come out of the original mold, but they're brand new. Uh, I love so much about that story. I do also have somewhere an alternate color. This is the dark gray version and it even has a different badge, which is kind of cool. You can compare the two there. And I have already a SX64 colors one, which is two-tone uh, sitting there on my other C64C. It comes with this lovely C64C Commodore branded case. So if you were to ever sell or store away your brand new Commodore 64, you've got a new box for it too. Yeah, I told you this would be 100% new Commodore 64. If it's a bread bin case you're after, as far as I know, still the only way to achieve that and truly go stack to the future is with my Lego Bricks D4 cases. All the links are in the description. So that's that. And we also have this. Uh, this is a brand new power supply. You can get these on Amazon and Fleabay. I wanted to do this because I'm leaving no turn left unstoned. Yeah. And finally, a new motherboard. Now, before we get to that, I should mention, obviously, other replacement motherboards exist. This is the 60 clone. And another great one is the C64 Reloaded Mark II, which is also supplied by iComp, who make those new cases. Isn't this beautiful? This is one of the reasons I'm so excited about making this video, because this is perhaps one of the sexiest things I've ever seen. I heard that. Sorry, darling. Second sexiest thing I've ever seen. Uh, it's the Evo 64. Now, quick disclaimer, this is their revision three prototype, and they've gone through, I think, two more revisions since they shipped this to me. And it will be available very soon in the final revision, 
but there are some changes. Now you might already be having some questions about that not everything here is brand new. I've got solutions and answers to all of that and we are in this video building a 100% new Commodore 64. But let's start at the beginning and I think this is the beginning isn't it where the power plug goes in. It's got some very interesting things on this side of the board that looks like an SD card but uh, I guess it's a voltage regulator of some kind. The model number says QB12GBU and you know actually just googling here it's actually um, an aerial laser guided bomb so that answers that. Nice to see they've thought of everything. Uh, we've got these beautiful capacitors with this satin finish here, but it's over here that we really see the big changes. So this is their new VIC-2 video circuit. This part is called Clear Video 64C, and as you'd imagine, it's super easy to configure. Now some of you will be familiar with my VIC-2 squared, which is the VIC-2 PAL NTSC switcher board. By the way, we recently made that open source as well, and you can find all the details at my website, linked in the description as always. But on this, you can put any kind of VIC-2 chip in here, PAL, NTSC, any revision, any model number. And um, you can see this one that they've kindly supplied with the board was built in week 43 of 1987. This Commodore 64 is PAL. But on this, if you want to put NTSC in there, you just configure it with these jumper settings here and it'll switch for you. Now you might be wondering, what are all these trim pots? Well, that essentially is like the Luma fix. Now we integrate that in the VIC-2 squared as well, but here it's integrated directly on the motherboard. And the main aim of that is to reduce jail bars and interference. Jail bars are the stripes that you see on some Commodore 64 outputs. Now, what I also love is these low profile ZIF style sockets. Look at this. You want to change out that chip for NTSC? <laughs> That is beyond magical. It's in. I love that so much. Okay. Uh, also here you can set the VIC of voltage because some VIC chips are 12 volts and some are five. And we must of course put in our VIC chip replacement. This is Randy Rossi's Kawari. And of course you won't be able to adjust those trim pots, but in theory that's not required. The jail bars are caused by the VIC chip itself, which is that this replaces for a much cleaner version. <laughs> ah, this is amazing. Up here, we have our SID amplifiers. Now you'll see that the video RF modulator that's usually on there is gone because that's all integrated into this circuit. And why have we got two amps marked SID1 and SID2? Well, because we've got two SID chips. So again, they've pre-populated this, so huge thanks to them. They give me twin arm SID chips in there. Now I have got uh, somewhere a swin SID, I think it is, but I don't have two of them. I have got a spare SID chip, but either way, that's what you do. You put your two SID chips in there and you can then get either dual mono six channel SID chip output or stereo six channel SID chip output instead of the boring old incredibly beautiful three channel output that we all know and love. So yes, and here is where you uh, adjust the volume, I guess, for each of those amplifiers. Again, you can configure here what, depending on what type of chip you have and a voltage jumper there, very careful, because if you put a nine volt SID chip in here to set it to 12 volts, you might fry poor little SID. And you don't want to do that because would you believe they even offer two amplifier upgrade options, including this hand-tuned tube amp setup for about $1,000, including audio grade toroidal power supply, or this new tube 64 based around the Korg new tube 6P1 amplifier for half the price of $500. Yep, your C64 can be a Korg now too. Well, kind of. So these are the stereo outputs for those stereo SID chips. This plugs in to this in-out interface here. Now, word about these ZIF sockets. There are gonna be various options when you buy this. Uh, you can solder everything on yourself, but put the sockets in, just normal sockets. You can put ZIF sockets in there if you want. And I think they're gonna give you the option of buying everything pre-soldered and all the ZIF sockets in there already. You will have to supply your own chips and also the EEPROM, which is basically the kernel chip is not gonna be flashed because they don't own the Commodore rights to that kernel. And we'll get to the EEPROM in a second. It's hiding right here. First up here, we've got our PLA chip. Now, usually there is a chip there and it looks just like that. Uh, the pro programmable, programmable, programmable logic array chip uh, is essentially the 
traffic director of the board and it tells everything what to do. Now I've got a replacement PLA chip as well, had I needed it, called Plankton, which you might be familiar with, and that's a brand new product. But on this, they've integrated it directly onto the board. That is the processor, the 6510. This actually in a little bit winky wonky. Oh, you know what? I can just do this. And I think that probably happened during transit. But wait, I hear you say, that's not 100% brand new. In fact, that's a 6510 from 1983, week 43 of that year. You're absolutely right. However, all you have to do is go to Monotech's website because they sell this. This is a MLS CPU replacer and it can allow you to swap out the 6510 that the C64 requires for the 6502. It does all the logic changes that are needed to allow the C64 to see that as a 6510. Lots of numbers, but long story short, you know, there's a drop down menu and you can buy it completely pre-configured with the chip pre-installed in there. I've ordered one of those, it's on the way from New Zealand, so we'll pop it in the board closer to the end of this video, assuming it arrives in time. But that means that this is also 100% brand new because the 6502 is still readily available. That brings us to the EEPROM. Now this is rather clever. This combines the three chips from the original Commodore 64, being the character set, the basic chip and the kernel chip into one. I don't know how it does that, but it does. It can be flashed with a whole bunch of stuff. You can actually add cartridge slots onto there, a bit like with the Easy Flash 3. And obviously you can put your own kernels in there. So Jiffy DOS, put a Jiffy Dolphin, and all that kind of stuff. These jumpers next to it are for telling the EEPROM which cartridge or kernel you want to use via various combinations of these. There is also a hotkey option available or will be available. They're working on it right now, so you'll be able to use different keyboard combinations. Right now, I'm gonna to have to use the jumpers. There is actually also a third party product that goes between the keyboard cable and the PCB, which plugs in there, and that will actually intercept and let you use keyboard combinations as well. Other than that, you've got your RAM chips and your logic chips here. Although I am told that on the later revisions of the board, those are now surface mounted, so even less chips to go wrong. And of course you won't have to solder those on. Those will all be supplied intact. So we've swept through the whole board, bringing us finally to the CIA chips. These are the uh, Central Intelligence Agency of the board. Now that stands for Complex Interface Adapter. And they are the interface between the input and output. Actually the same chip. We've got two here, both made in February 1988. But I hear you cry, those aren't brand new. I thought, you're right. Oh. But there is a solution. Now don't worry, I am going to completely solve this by the end of this very video. There is a chap making brand new Commodore, uh, brand new CIA chips. He says it's now essentially done, as to quote him, done. Uh, unfortunately, he doesn't post updates very often. So I think that's one of those ones where we just have to wait for him to officially release it. If you are watching this and you are that certain chap or chap S, I would love to obviously buy one and test it out. Buy two, <laughs> buy one, get one free maybe. But for now, um, we can't actually put that in the socket, which is slightly frustrating, but because those keycaps have arrived, I wanted to make this video. But we can have a little fun, and I've created here a mock-up of how this is going to look once we've got all the parts installed. You can see there the Kawari replacing the VIC chip, the 6502 and its adapter replacing the 6510, and those new JCIA chips replacing the CIAs. And what you're looking at here is completely achievable, if I could get hold of some of those beta tests of the CIA chips, but would be the world's first brand new Commodore 64. But would bees aren't good enough for my viewers, so we're going to solve this in a different way in just a few moments. We're so close and this thing is so sexy. Sorry, drooling a little bit. So that's it, that's this board. I think all that remains is to put the whole thing together in the case. Come on, let's go.
juicy. It is quite a thing having a brand new Commodore 64 keyboard and keycaps. We've been waiting for this for decades. Now these keycaps are incredible and he has done a fantastic job. If I was forced to make a complaint, it would be that the equals sign <laughs> doesn't equal straightness. Yeah, the factory has printed it slightly winky wonky, so they just need a bit better quality control over there in China. Obviously wasn't made out of PCB way. Or you could give PCBs for five dollars. And make sure you check out their retro stuffs category, where you can find all the kind of stuff that we love. You might even find something made by me. Have do you, Perry Fractic? Thanks, Harley Fractic and PCB Way. So yeah, let's return to the assembly. I actually used to work in a keyboard factory back in 1992, but unfortunately they let me go because I didn't put in enough shifts. I'm having a tiny bit of trouble getting this to stay in the hole, as you can see. Don't understand why space bars have to be so fiddly. I'm sure there was, there was a better way to do this back in the day. <laughs> what a mess, oh my God. It's time to bring out the big guns. Oh, that's, I just love Superclue, don't you? <laughs> so I think what's to blame here is this metal bar. It's hand bent, and as you can see, these two ends are somewhat different. Might be better, also might be worse. Unfortunately now it's better, but it's coming unclipped every time I press it. So I just need to make this a little shorter. <sighs> now I did check in with the eBay seller and uh, he is aware of the problem and he's looking to mass produce these parts in the next batch. So that should mean that they're more accurate. Oh, I love it when a plan comes together. 
how our keyboard is finished. That is quite a thing, isn't it? That is a thing of beauty. Uh, in case you're wondering why I went for fairly understated colors, well, as you can see, they are semi-transparent, but I wanted to keep the kind of feel of this, an original Commodore 64 keyboard. So some of them, as you know, had orange function keys, so I went for the transparent red here, um, but overall, wow. <laughs> and it keeps coming back to me, this is completely new, completely brand new. There's a little comparison just because we can, the old and the new. Love it. Now our next challenge is getting this into here. As you may know, we need to 3D print some keyboard mounts that are gonna go here and here. So let's go print those now. And here we are. Uh, now I have recorded the, recorded, I have 3D printed these in draft mode just to make sure that they fit and everything. So I have run into a problem here, which is why, again, why I did the draft print. These brand new joystick ports have a wider shell than the original. So this is designed to clip over it and it doesn't quite make it, as you can see. So obviously we can adjust the 3D model to make that wider. I have forgotten one thing. <laughs> ah, this is amazing. Pin one goes down and pin one is usually the black. forgotten one thing. The LED goes in there. You thought that was going to be old, didn't you? Nope, that's brand new too. These are rather sexy uh, blue ones. There is nothing else left to do except put this on. This is really cool. <laughs> Look at this, guys. Let me bring the lighting down a bit. That's pretty cool. So we've got a light up, power supply, and our blue LED. I think everything's working. Let's go try it out.
isn't that something really special? I love particularly the dual SID chip option, uh, the fact that the kernel's built in. They even give you full instructions on how to flash that kernel with other ROMs and cartridges and that kind of thing. A really detailed guide there that's beyond the scope of this build video. And when you'll be able to hot switch between cartridges and ROMs using the keyboard instead of jumpers, I really don't think I have any downsides of this product at all. However, it's not 100% new. Even though I've swapped in an 8501 processor with that adapter, which arrived from New Zealand, it still has old CIA chips. How do we do that without CIA chips, I hear you ask? Well, the answer is this. This is... <laughs> that is the little uh, spacer that goes under here. This is the Ultimate 64, and it is, I believe, the Ultimate 64. Now, if you've been following the community for a while, you'll know a lot about this. But what I love about it is that it, <laughs> put that to one side, it does follow the Commodore 64 form factor, is compatible with all the cases and the keyboards, the keyboard plugs in over here this time. Uh, you can see the ports are the same. It has a slightly different power requirement, but that's fine. It has a power button and everything else you'd expect. And the user port is replaced by USB. What could be more perfect than that? And of course, HDMI output for the perfect video and ethernet. There's even a Wi-Fi on board. He hasn't activated that yet. I think he's had some problems, but you can see the little antenna there. I did get Wi-Fi working with this by using an external Ethernet to Wi-Fi adapter. So I can now ping games to review for Zap64, for example, from my office to this without even pulling out a USB stick. Now I hear you say, Oh yes, but it doesn't have dual SID chips. Well, yes, it offers that option too. You just plonk them in here. They are, of course, partly analog chips. So it's not possible to 100% replicate them in an FPGA, but this does a pretty damn good job. I can't really honestly hear the difference. There is the FPGA that contains a complete replication of all those other chips that make the C64 run, including the processor. So we don't even need an adapter. Our LED plugs in there. But I do notice there's a USB socket on the inside of this, which has given me an idea. Let's make this really special by placing some LED strips around the keyboard and moving my wife into the, sorry, my Wi-Fi into the case as well. Cause it's got some very nice flashing lights that will look great through that transparent top. Hmm. The other thing I like about these cases is they are push clip. You don't actually have to screw them in if you're always in and out and shaking it all about. And this actually looks rather nice in this two-tone, doesn't it? Silver and see-through. What do you mean my parts are showing? Oh my. That's beautiful. And I just realized for the first time possibly in history, I'm holding a 100% brand new Commodore 64 with all new parts that you can buy off the shelf. Oh.
And as you'd expect, the image quality is sublime. Look at that. And touching the power button here brings up the internal menu with virtually no jumper changes needed for this machine. The Wi-Fi is connected and I can FTP files to it at this IP address. And there are literally hundreds of settings, including, of course, changing the kernel and character ROMs. Ta-da! And there's Jiffy Dos again for faster game loading and more. And yet more options in this menu, including I notice an LED strip control, which can link the SID chip for sound light shows. I'd need this special strip for that though. And of course you can load games from USB thumb drive. And this being a new C64, let's play a brand new game with our brand new wireless gamepad. Guys, we did it. We built actually not one, but two new Commodore 64s. One of them we'll call 99.9% .9 all new and the other 100%. And if you need help deciding which new C64 to go for, I've created this little configurator. Pause the video to read it. Now it may be that FPGA is not your thing. Um, I would never said that it's possible to create a completely new Commodore 64 without an FPGA. Even the Evo 64, if you want a replacement VIC chip, you have to use the Spartan FPGA that's on the Kawari board. So this is how it's going to be. We are going to have to make a few little sacrifices now and then. And what this allows us is the C64 will never die. I think that's rather magical. And as always, subscribe and support below. I will see you soon, and cheerio. With an Ultimate 64, we don't need the Evo 64 anymore, so I'm going to get rid of that. I actually didn't mean to let go of it. Could you send us another one, please? <laughs> Just kidding. This is actually donor board that couldn't be saved and has had all its chips harvested. Don't worry, I wouldn't do that to the Evo 64. I actually really love that thing.